Uh, this is Mark Richardson. I'm the speaker this evening. Thank you all for joining me. Uh, this is a, a topic that I really enjoy uh, speaking about. Um, you all should be ashamed for uh, signing up for a class on murdering your lawn, um, but I'm right there with you. Uh, this is a, a topic that I really enjoy talking about. Uh, it's very fitting for Earth Day. Um, and so let's just dive right in. Uh, I'd like to mention here at the beginning, this session is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel and available through our homepage at towerhillbg.org. Um, so you'll be able to watch it again if you, if you so choose uh, a little bit later on. Um, just getting a chat message, so I wanted to make sure it wasn't from someone who wasn't able to hear me, but um, okay, so we'll just go ahead and get started. So uh, thank you for joining me this, this evening. This is Kill Your Lawn. I'm Mark Richardson. I'm the Horticulture Director for Tower Hill Botanic Garden, um, and at, at some point along the way, uh, this sort of became the American ideal uh, landscape, and uh, as someone who's been in the field of horticulture for more than 20 years, uh, I find this incredibly off-putting. I find it really drab, really sterile. Uh, there's not a whole lot of color here. Um, you know, really the main feature is a, a mulch island with a few trees uh, and this very carefully clipped uh, uh, lawn as the sort of central feature of this landscape. And I, I find it really boring. This is not something that I really uh, aspire to uh, find in my own garden. This is not um, something that I really want to see in other people's gardens. Um, but for whatever reason, this has become the sort of standard that people aspire to. And this is a very damaging landscape. And that's what we're going to talk about this evening. Um, and so we're, we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about why we should be considering killing our lawns. Uh, we'll spend some time talking about how to do that. And then finally, I'll give you some options for great plants that you can use uh, as a replacement for your lawn. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, I figure there's no, uh, no better way to start with a, a discussion about um, killing your lawn, lawn than with this headline that ran in the Washington Post a few years back. And it says, lawns are a soul crushing time suck and most of us would be better off without them. Uh, I don't think there's any message that more uh, closely encapsulates what I feel about lawns. Um, you know, it's uh, lawn care takes up the better part of most people's weekends. Um, lawn care is this American obsession um, that uh, I don't think we quite fully understand. Uh, I'm not sure where it came from, uh, but it's, uh, it's something that we all grew up with. Uh, you know, there are definitely some sort of romantic ideals um, the, the white picket fence, the, uh, you know, the yard with a, with a nice flat lawn, that, that uh, great fragrance of a freshly cut lawn uh, that we all sort of remember from our childhoods. Um, so there are definitely some great associations with the lawn, but it's become this obsession that's really rather unhealthy. Um, so unhealthy um, that, uh, that I just wanna spend a little bit of time kind of talking about the, the economic impact of lawn care and go to one extreme. Um, so obviously this is the White House. I spent a few years uh, working in the Washington DC area. Uh, when I was in the DC area, I was working at a garden called Brookside Gardens, uh, which was just north of Washington DC in a town called Wheaton, Maryland. Um, and I spent quite a bit of time uh, in and around uh, Washington DC. Spent a lot of time visiting Smithsonian Gardens while I was down there um, and spent a lot of time uh, on the National Mall. And this is what the National Mall looked like when I was, uh, when I was in DC. Uh, you can see it was loved to death. Um, the mall is America's front yard. Uh, that's what we call it. Uh, it's a very simple landscape. Uh, it's this very strong central um, uh, green space corridor of uh, carefully clipped lawn uh, surrounded by trees. Um, it's a very sort of um, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted uh, inspired landscape. In fact, I think Frederick Law Olmsted did the original design uh, for, the, uh, for the mall. Uh, I, I might be wrong about that, so don't quote me on it. Um, but the, the mall is in essence, uh, you know, acres and acres of grass. And it looks like this. And this is what a lot of our lawns look like. Patchy, um, uh, you know, love to death. Uh, we love to spend time on our lawns. We love to play uh, soccer. We love to let the dog run around. Um, and uh, lawns really uh, can't necessarily always tolerate that amount of foot traffic. And they certainly can't tolerate the amount of foot traffic that the National Mall receives. Um, for years, there was a lot of debate uh, about whether Congress would invest in restoring the National Mall. Um, 
they uh, finally formed a nonprofit organization called the Trust for the National Mall. Um, got a lot of private funding um, to invest and some federal dollars as well. All told, this was an $852 million restoration project. And this was just for the first phase of the uh, restoration of the National Mall. It involved removal and replacement of the uh, is existing soil, which was so heavily compacted, it couldn't really be reused. Uh, involved installation of uh, massive irrigation system, lots of under drains. Um, you remember Washington DC is built on a swamp. Uh, so drainage is very important in that area uh, in order to, to keep a lawn happy. Uh, and it also involved some um, green initiatives. So some, you know, some care was taken to try to make this lawn less bad than the uh, previous lawn had been. Um, so they included a 250,000 gallon cistern, uh, which um, uh, basically captured storm water that could then be repurposed for uh, for use for irrigation of the of the uh, new lawn that was put in. Um, this is a massive restoration project. Um, took years to complete. Lots of heavy equipment. Uh, this is a, a shot. This may have been taken from some place some place close to the. Uh, uh, Smithsonian Castle, if you're familiar with uh, the mall um, in that area. You can see the Washington Monument off to the left of the image. You can see the uh, Capitol building off to the right. Um, and this is what it looked like for, uh, for many, many months uh, as, this, as the mall was being restored. Massive, massive project um, to ultimately um, bring this uh, to bear. So this is what the National Mall restoration uh, ended up looking like. Um, you know, you're left with this rather drab and sterile landscape uh, that to be honest in 10 or 15 years time is going to look a lot like that first image that we saw um, and you know because this is a, a green space that gets used very frequently um, uh, it's used for you know far too many uh, events far too many large gatherings um, this is uh, this is just the reality of what this uh, what this central lawn is going to look like uh, in time. It's not going to hold up uh, and it's going to cost uh, a whole lot more than it did this last time around to restore it. So um, within a short amount of time, uh, we will be having to restore them all again. Um, and it just, you know, spending that much money, investing that many resources uh, in a landscape that uh, really doesn't want to be there uh, in a climate that isn't really conducive to it. Um, and uh, requires a whole lot of inputs to keep that uh, lawn happy um, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And so what I'm hoping to do tonight is convince you that uh, this should not be the American ideal. This should not be what we're all looking for uh, out of our green spaces. There are, there are definitely better ways to, uh, to manage our landscapes. Lawns are fine in certain circumstances. Uh, athletic fields really need to be lawn. There's no better surface for uh, a soccer uh, match, a football game. Baseball really needs to be played uh, with, uh, you know, surrounding of, of turf. Um, so there's, there's definitely a place for it, but it shouldn't be the default landscape. Uh, it should really be, you know, something that we used sparingly uh, because of the environmental and economic impacts. Um, so again, here's the overall outline for this evening. What's so bad about my lawn? Uh, okay, I get it. Uh, my lawn is terrible. How can I get rid of it? Uh, but how can I do so in a sustainable way? Uh, and then finally, you've convinced me my lawn is dead. Now what do I do? Um, so these are the topics that we'll touch on this evening. First, I think it's important that we have a working definition for what I mean by lawn. Um, there are lots of different types of lawn. Um, there are lots of different approaches to lawn care. I will say I have three kids, uh, a 14 year old, an 11 year old, and a two year old. We spend a lot of time outdoors. Um, and I have a lot of areas around my home that uh, look like lawn. Um, you know, they're not particularly well manicured. They're not particularly well cared for. I don't ever put fertilizer on my lawn. I don't ever irrigate my lawn. I've got a lot of areas in my lawn that are sort of dead and patchy at times of, this, to, of the year. I have a lot of areas of my lawn that are uh, covered in uh, what other people might consider weeds. Um, that's all okay with me. As long as my kids can use it and my kids can have a good time on it, uh, that's fine. Uh, once my kids are old and older and out of the house, I'll probably have a lot less of that sort of lawn-like um, green space around my house. A uh, lot more gardens, a lot more interesting plants. Um, but for now, at this point in my life, it's, it's sort of a necessary um, green space. Uh, but I try to maintain my lawn in a way that I can be as environmentally responsible as possible. Um, 
So that's not exactly what I mean by lawn. What I really mean is uh, the, the sort of um, crazy obsessed uh, type of lawn that we uh, find in a lot of our green spaces. Um, so a lawn is really a monoculture of primarily cool season turf, green, turf grasses that are native to Europe. Um, so things like Kentucky bluegrass, um, things like bent grass, things like rye, uh, these are all um, these are all European turf grass species that are used to uh, a cooler climate with a lot more moisture, uh, with far uh, less acid soils. Um, uh, it's recreation space. It's uh, able to withstand repeated foot traffic, recover quickly from foot traffic. Um, all told in the US, we have about 40, 40 or more million acres of lawn. Uh, and when I say 40 or more million acres, that's irrigated lawn across the US. So my lawn wouldn't uh, be included in that, uh, in that tab. And that all told is almost 2% of the total acreage in the country. Um, irrigated turf grass is the single largest crop uh, America grows. Um, so this is a massive, massive uh, uh, piece of our landscape in the U.S. Um, and all told, according to Bloomberg News, we spend about $40 billion a year on lawn care, uh, far more than we spend on foreign aid. Um, and it's, it's really time we started thinking about that uh, money a little bit differently. Uh, and then finally, I, I, uh, I'm not a huge uh, Michael Pollan fan, but his first book was really fantastic. It's a book called Second Nature, you know, sort of his evolution into gardening. Um, but, and this great quote uh, is, is from that book, Second Nature. I really love it. And, uh, and I think about this a lot. It's a lawn is nature under totalitarian rule. A lawn is sort of our you know, that's, that's the, the pinnacle, right? Um, it's uh, when you think about how much is invested in caring for, maintaining, uh, establishing a lawn in the first place, uh, you know, it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of resources, it's a lot of dollars. Uh, and it's really us sort of projecting that, that rule that we have, or that totalitarian rule that we feel like we have over the landscape. And I, I think we can do things a little bit better and a little bit differently. Um, in terms of what's bad about lawns, why am I railing against them? What do I have against them? Uh, well, first of all, um, lawns use a lot of resources. Uh, they use a lot of uh, water. In the Northeast, um, we have a very dry summer. We get droughty in the summertime. Oftentimes we'll go into the fall um, in sort of a droughty condition. Uh, this will get worse and worse as the climate continues to change. Um, and uh, that uh, really requires us to irrigate our lawns. <clears throat> when I mentioned earlier that uh, our lawns are typically composed of, or are, are composed of European turf grasses, cool season turf grasses. Um, they're from a climate that doesn't get as hot and doesn't get as dry as our climate does in the middle of the summer. Um, but they're also, uh, they're meant to be dormant in the summer. So during the time when, you know, we're going to baseball games and we're having backyard barbecues, we want our lawn to look, uh, look its best. Uh, that's when it really wants to be sort of sleeping. It's uh, your, your, those cool season turf grasses want to be active in the spring. They want to be active in the fall. That's when they're nice and green and healthy and lush and happy. Um, and the only way that we can really keep them actively growing over the summer is to provide artificial irrigation. Uh, in essence, to make them think that um, it's not summer, but it's spring or it's fall. They've got ample moisture uh, and they should be growing and we should continue to uh, have to mow them all summer long. Um, so uh, that requires a lot of irrigation. Um, in the Western United States where uh, water is really scarce and very expensive, uh, up to 60% of the residential water uh, usage um, is just for irrigating lawns. Uh, here in the Northeast, it's, it's a, around 30%. So that means a third of the potable water. So water that is um, uh, expensive to produce, uh, it's treated, it's moved from uh, one spot to another spot through series of pipes. Um, uh, you know, coming from a, a, a drinking water system, drinking supply system that a town manages. Um, this is not the uh, recycled irrigation or the recycled stormwater, uh, as in the example of the National Mall. This is residential potable water that could be used for drinking um, is, is put out for watering turf grass. So it, as much as a third of our residential water usage uh, is just for irrigating turf. Um, and I, I say that this bottom piece uh, will sort of carry through this next series of slides. This is only necessary because turf grasses are not adapted to our climate. 
again, we're too hot in the summer. Our soils are too acid. Uh, we have the wrong climate for a lot of these species. Um, we artificial, artificially prop them up over the summer um, by dumping copious amounts of water on them. Lawns also require a lot of pesticides. Uh, this is, this is, these are some uh, scary statistics, actually. Um, if you want that perfectly manicured lawn, the only way to achieve that is by using pesticides. Um, and I don't distinguish between um, synthetic and organic um, pesticides, uh, but most of our lawns are, uh, are certainly uh, managed with synthetic pesticides. Um, so uh, the EPA estimates that about 30,000 tons of pesticides across the country are, are put down on lawns every single year. It's kind of a big number and it's tough to wrap your head around that, what that means. So I, I try to put this into a different perspective for you. Um, think about, uh, according to UMass, the average commercial lawn service uh, applies anywhere between five and seven pounds per acre of pesticides um, to a typical lawn that's under a, a typical lawn service. So this is a commercial uh, applicator who's putting out pesticides um, that they're being paid by a client to put out. Um, their interest is in putting out as little product as possible to keep you, the consumer, happy. Uh, and so they're putting out, you know, uh, very sort of uh, conservative amounts of pesticides. Uh, we all know that the backyard uh, lawn care guy uh, figures, well, if, if two pounds is good, then four pounds is better. So I'm going to double the application rate. Uh, that happens pretty frequently. Um, so this uh, number that I'm using, that five to seven pounds per acre, is a professional making an application, not the uh, average backyard lawn guy who's probably putting out a lot more than that. Um, just to put that into a, a, a different kind of perspective, um, we think about pesticide usage for certain agricultural crops. Uh, sweet corn in our area receives the, uh, or across the country receives the highest amount of pesticides per acre. Uh, that's at two and a half pounds per acre. So to grow food for feeding people, um, the agricultural crop that requires the highest amount or uh, on average has the highest amount of pesticides applied to it, um, gets about two and a half pounds per acre. We put twice, if not three times, if not four times amount, uh, the amount of pesticides down on our lawns. And again, that's only necessary because turf grasses are not adapted to our climate. They're not meant to grow here. Um, and I, I know a lot of times people say, well, it's their pesticides they're not, you know, they're not really as harmful as we might think. Um, this is a chart from an organization called Beyond Pesticides uh, that talks about the health effects of 30 commonly used lawn pesticides. One of the reasons that I don't use any pesticides on my lawn is because my dog likes to play on my lawn, my kids like to play on my lawn. The last thing I want to do is put them in harm's way. The last thing I want is for them to come into contact with any of these harmful chemicals. Um, the top one there, or actually all these on the left are all herbicides. Uh, so most of the time we think of herbicides as being uh, pretty innocuous. Uh, we think of them as chemicals that uh, you know, don't really have much of an impact on our, uh, our, on our um, uh, biological systems. But as you can see, 2,4-D, one of the most commonly applied pesticides, herbicides uh, on the market is not only um, uh, a known carcinogen, it's an endocrine disruptor, it causes reproductive effects, it's a neurotoxin, causes kidney and liver damage, uh, irritated skin, and birth defects. Uh, so pretty great product, not something I would want to be putting out uh, and then allowing my kids or my dog uh, to go roll around in the lawn. But oftentimes we think nothing of it. Uh, let's talk about fertilizers for a minute. Again, I make no distinction between organic and synthetic fertilizers. They're both equally bad in my, in my book. Uh, once you apply a fertilizer, it's a free source of pollution. Um, so whether it's derived from a, an organic source or a synthetic source makes no difference to me. Uh, it's still a fertilizer, it's still a pollutant. Um, in the Northeast, we always will need to fertilize our lawns in order to keep them green and healthy, uh, especially through the summer. Um, we put out on average 3 million tons of fertilizer uh, across the country. That's out of uh, uh, 21 million tons total. Remember, lawns are the single biggest irrigated crop in the country. Uh, it stands to reason that they would uh, uh, be the lion's share of, of fertilizers or, or you know, require uh, and, and have a lot of fertilizer applied to them. Um, there are 
sort of new fertilizer regulations in New England. Massachusetts has a, a plant nutrient regulation that most people don't know exists. Uh, Connecticut has one as well. Um, these are meant to regulate the fertilizers that we're putting out. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Um, the bottom line is in New England, our soils are too acid. Uh, we try to keep lawns artificially propped up through the summer uh, and keep them green at a time when they really want to be brown and dormant. Um, and so again, fertilizers on lawns are really only necessary because turf grasses are not adapted to our climate. This is a little bit from the uh, the the uh, plant nutrient regulation that was passed in Massachusetts. The section that I've highlighted there in red um, uh, tells you really all you need to know. In mass, um, the only nutrient that's regulated is phosphorus. And so you may have noticed in the last few years when you go to buy fertilizer at the hardware store, um, it's off, there are three numbers on a bag of fertilizer. Uh, and those three numbers are uh, first nitrogen, N, uh, phosphorus, P, and then potassium, K, NPK. Uh, and now it's really difficult to find any fertilizer that has um, any phosphorus in it at all. Turns out we don't really don't ever need to apply phosphorus. There's plenty of available phosphorus in uh, most of our soils. Um, so we were just applying phosphorus for no reason whatsoever. It just came in the bag. Um, and unfortunately, the Massachusetts regulations don't have a lot of teeth. Uh, this is um, uh, policed by the Department of Agriculture. I've never seen a Department of Agricultural police car. Uh, so there's really very little, um, uh, there's really very little supervision or um, uh, you know, management of this. Um, people are still applying lawn fertilizers willy-nilly uh, without even recognizing that they're breaking the law. Um, uh, so hopefully these laws get a little bit stricter and a little bit um, more enforced in coming years um, because it's really important for water quality that we're restricting these, uh, these uh, fertilizers from being used as much as they, they are. Um, and then let's talk a little bit about fossil fuels and emissions. Uh, I mentioned early on that I have, you know, what some people might consider a lawn. I've got some green space that my kids like to run around on. I still have to mow that lawn. Um, so for as much as I'm trying to be a responsible steward, uh, trying to keep my kids protected from harmful pesticides, um, trying not to irrigate and trying not to uh, fertilize, I'm still burning fossil fuels. And um, one thing to recognize with uh, lawn care equipment is that the typical lawnmower running for about an hour uh, is equivalent to driving 100 miles in a car. Um, couple different reasons for this. One is that there aren't those same strict uh, emission standards for uh, small engines as there, as there are for, um, for automobiles. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot more emissions are spitting out of those, uh, those lawnmowers. The other piece, and this is something that I'm really guilty of, is we tend to hang on to our lawnmowers for a long time. Um, so I'm running a lawnmower that's probably 15, if not 20 years old. Uh, and so any advances in emissions um, that may be in new equipment um, are not something that hits the market very quickly because the average backyard uh, lawn care person is not uh, buying a new mower every couple of years in the same way that they're buying a new vehicle, uh, a new car to drive. Um, something else is there's a lot of pollution uh, with uh, fossil fuels. Um, so just put this in a, a little bit of uh, perspective. I remember the Exxon Valdez spill uh, from the late 80s. I think it was 1989. Uh, that spill was about 10.8 million gallons of oil that spilled off the, uh, uh, the coast of Alaska. Um, it's estimated that every year, Americans spill 17 million gallons of gas just filling up their lawn care equipment. Uh, that's a, an awful lot of gas. Um, and I will say there have been efforts in recent years to, uh, to try to minimize the amount of spillage um, and to try to uh, minimize the amount of, uh, of volatilization of uh, gasoline that happens uh, while people are filling up their small uh, equipment. You, you may have noticed that it's hard and harder and harder to find a, a gas can with a spout that works very well. Uh, there are all these uh, you know, clean air regulated um, spouts now. Uh, these are really difficult and I'll, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, the new uh, spouts, I find I spill a lot more gas with the new spouts than I did uh, with an old spout that just had a, a, a very simple spout. Um, so you know, there have been efforts to make things uh, greener, but unfortunately they've fallen a little bit flat and haven't had quite the impact that I think people are looking for. 
And then the, the last topic of conversation uh, under this uh, subject of what's so bad about my lawn, um, I think many of you on the, on the call this evening uh, understand what an invasive species is. We have a, a regulated invasive plants in Massachusetts, plants that you're not able to buy, uh, plants that you're not able to sell, things like uh, burning bush, things like Japanese barberry. Um, these are plants that we recognize are incredibly harmful to our environment and plants that we regulate. Uh, we say that you, know, you can't grow burning bush, uh, you can't sell burning bush, you can't plant burning bush um, because it's, it's harmful to our environment. Uh, and what that harm is, uh, is sort of this defined here by uh, both the Natural Resource Conservation Service in the first definition, uh, and then a pre presidential executive order in the second definition. So an invasive species is one uh, that is both non-native uh, and then able to establish on many sites, grow quickly and spread to the point of disrupting plant communities or ecosystems. That's how the NRCS defines uh, invasive plant species. Um, if we're honest with ourselves, you know, so turf grass lawns sort of fit that definition, right? Um, if we take ourselves out of the equation, pretend like we don't have to manage them and, uh, and coddle them along, um, I would say that we've got a lot of turf grass out there. It's established on many sites. It grows quickly. Um, it spreads to the point of disrupting plant communities. I serve on the Conservation Commission in Uxbridge, uh, and a lot of the violators of uh, wetlands regulations end up being people who live close to a wetland resource area and just want a larger lawn. Uh, and so they, they violate the, uh, the buffer zones to spread their lawn out a little bit more. Um, you know, there's real ecological harm that's happening um, through our lawns uh, in, in many, many different ways, through fertilizers and pesticides, um, uh, runoff water that gets into uh, critical sensitive ecosystems. Um, so I think it's time we start thinking of um, our carefully manicured lawns as not the ideal that we all want to aspire to, um, but something that really should be more strictly uh, or, or, uh, or we should be more judicious in how we apply them in the, on the landscape, and we should be looking to other options for, uh, uh, for our, you know, that sort of default landscape that exists in, in, our, in our country and in our lives. And then finally, I mentioned this earlier, I just find lawns to be incredibly boring and sterile. The, the striping in that image to the right does nothing for me. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I don't find that to be particularly attractive. I don't see this as a landscape that I really want to flock to. Uh, there's no color. Uh, you know, it's very uh, boring. Uh, it's a monoculture of turf grass that just doesn't really do it for me. Uh, I think there are many, many better ways we can garden. There are many, many better ways that we can uh, manage our landscapes in many more interesting ways. Um, and so take all the ecological impacts and all the economic impacts out of it. Uh, there's a better way to garden and we can do a lot better. All right, so uh, hopefully I've convinced you that lawns are bad, that we should be doing all we can to minimize their use. Um, now let's talk a few about uh, some ways that we can sustainably rid ourselves. Remember, you know, we're, we're, we're minimizing lawn because we care about the environment. Um, so the worst, the last thing we want to do is go out and strip our lawns away in a way that's going to be just as environmentally uh, uh, damaging. Um, so let's talk about a few different ways we can do this, a few different ways we can kill off our lawn. Uh, solarization, mechanical removal, chemical removal, sheet mulching, and then finally my, my preferred option, which is just benign neglect. Solarization is a pretty simple concept. Uh, essentially what it entails is covering an area in uh, plastic sheeting. Um, this is something that with a lawn you would want to do in the height of summer. Uh, when the sun is at its hottest, when it's at its highest level, uh, in order to have the best effect. Um, clear plastic certainly works a lot better than black plastic. Um, black plastic seems like it would work well, but with clear plastic, you really get that greenhouse effect. And essentially what you're doing is um, steam pasteurizing the soil to try to kill any vegetation that might be in it. Um, so use clear plastic. Um, it creates this little uh, micro greenhouse effect underneath that plastic. 
Uh, it's important to uh, clip the lawn, make sure it's nice and short, uh, and then water it ahead of time. Remember, I said this is like steam pasteurization. You want to make sure that the, uh, the area is good and wet um, before you uh, put the plastic over it so that you can get the, the most bang for the buck. Uh, it's really important that you bury the edges to create this airtight seal, watertight seal, um, and then expect that this is going to take about six weeks. Um, so you'll definitely make friends with your neighbors when you do this in your front lawn, uh, but it's a fantastic way to, you know, sort of op uh, open up a conversation maybe uh, about what you're doing and why. Um, it does take time. Uh, it's very effective. And I don't think there's a, a more, uh, I don't think there's a, a better way from an environmental standpoint because it's very passive uh, to just throw out some plastic and kill that lawn. Uh, this is an incredibly uh, sustainable way to rid yourself of lawn. Uh, one question that I frequently get about this, um, this technique is what happens to soil microbes? Uh, we know that soil microbes are important um, and we, uh, we, we understand that doing something like steam pasteurization uh, will certainly kill off soil microbes. Uh, and what I'll say is a lot of them will go dormant in high, high temperatures. Uh, they'll come raging back. Um, but it's also a good idea if you're going to do solarization um, to apply some compost and deliver some new uh, soil microbes to the area um, before you try to plant it out after you've removed the lawn. Mechanical removal. So this is pretty simple. Um, you can do this either with simple hand tools if you've got a small area or you could rent a, a sod cutter. Uh, I've looked for sod cutters before. Some hardware stores carry them. Um, they're not that difficult to find. Uh, sod cutter really just basically shaves off that, uh, that, um, that grass, gets the crown, which is the most important part, um, and really strips off that vegetation um, so that you can replant with something else. It's a very simple process, um, but it is disturbance. And what this will do is it'll uh, lead to uh, weed seed germinating um, and it leads to a little bit of soil loss. Um, and so it's you know not my preferred method. Um, I, think, uh, I think solarization is definitely my preferred me method, um, uh, but um, uh, this is a good, a good substitute, a good second way to, uh, to go ab about removing your lawn. Definitely can be pretty backbreaking, um, pretty labor intensive. Um, I, I just want to pause for a minute and say, um, I, I should have mentioned this in the very beginning. If you do have questions as we go, you're all muted. Uh, you can't um, unmute yourself. And that's just in the interest of time and, and, uh, and flow with the presentation. If you'd like to ask questions, there is a chat feature. Um, so if you drag your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, um, you should see the chat feature and you can post any questions that you might have there. Uh, and then I'll answer questions at the very end of the presentation. Um, I did see that one question about uh, the iconic lawn uh, there at Tower Hill. Um, and Tower Hill doesn't apply any fertilizers on that lawn. Uh, we don't apply any pesticides on that lawn. Uh, if you look at that lawn, it is pretty weedy. Uh, it's not in the best uh, shape, uh, but it certainly provides that green um, uh, carpet that we're really looking for. Um, so there are ways to have a lawn that's less bad. Um, it's, it's certainly not the most sustainable. Uh, it's not as sustainable as it could be, but it's, uh, it's definitely not uh, as bad as it could be either. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about, about some of our efforts to minimize our, uh, our carbon footprint through our uh, lawn care as well um, in just a few minutes. Um, so another option is chemical removal. I will say this is, um, this is one of the quickest and most effective ways to remove a lawn. Uh, using a broad spectrum herbicide, something like glyphosate is a really effective way uh, to, to rid yourself of lawn. Um, and the beauty of using something like that is that the plants die in, the plant dies in place. Um, so you're not removing any of that organic material uh, as you are with mechanical removal. Um, and you know, this can be a, a very sustainable way to, uh, to remove a lawn. You don't have the same effect of um, uh, disturbing the soil um, and inviting weed seeds to germinate. You don't have the same uh, uh, effect of removing all that organic matter, which is important for plant growth uh, and microbial health. Uh, and it's a lot quicker than solarization would be. 
Um, there are different approaches to uh, chemical uh, removal of a lawn. Uh, and again, a little distinction here between organic and inorganic fertilizers. A lot of times we think of organic options as uh, a greener choice or maybe a healthy, um, uh, more sustainable choice. And sometimes that's true and sometimes it isn't. And so one thing I like to try to point out to people is um, don't don't seek out a, an organic product and think that it's safe um, because oftentimes it isn't. So here are a couple of examples. Uh, a common organic herbicide is uh, something called clove oil. And clove oil, as it turns out, is a known carcinogen. You have to be really careful using that material, especially if you're using it frequently um, to manage weeds in your garden. Um, and then another common organic herbicide is acetic acid. This is highly concentrated vinegar, essentially. Um, homeowners in Massachusetts, uh, the average backyard gardener can buy acetic acid, uh, I think at strengths up to 8% to use as, a, as an herbicide. Uh, if you're a commercial applicator, you can buy acetic acid and apply it uh, at rates of uh, about 20%. Um, the uh, vinegar, like white vinegar, I think it uh, has less than 1% acetic acid in it, just to give you some perspective. Um, acetic acid is, is uh, really harmful. Uh, it has a lower LD50 than glyphosate. So glyphosate, it turns out, is, uh, is um, a lot safer to use than this common organic herbicide. Uh, it also um, it can be a, a pretty harmful skin irritant. It can definitely damage your eyes if it gets into your eyes. Um, so it's, we have to be really careful about um, choosing a chemical route, whether we're using a, a synthetic or inorganic or an organic approach. Um, but this can be a pretty quick and, uh, and uh, relatively sustainable way, uh, single application of a, a chemical herbicide to kill off a lawn. Another option is smothering or sheet mulching. This is a fantastic way to kill a lawn. Um, uh, you can do this with a temporary covering like landscape fabric, um, it's something that would need to be removed after you're finished with it, or you can do it with something that's uh, going to break down. So putting a thick layer of cardboard, uh, I've seen people use newspaper, uh, cardboard is definitely more effective than newspaper would be, and then adding organic materials on top of that cardboard. This is a great way to build some nice healthy fertile soils for uh, the garden that you'd ultimately like to, like to put in place of your lawn. Um, you layer on compost, mulch. Uh, this is definitely a quick method. Some people call this method lasagna mulching, um, but it's very slow. Uh, and what I uh, typically recommend with sheet mulching is that you plan to sheet mulch for a whole season before you really start to plant out your garden. By that time, that layer of cardboard has pretty much rotted away. You can plant right through it. Um, but this is an incredibly sustainable way and a great way to build healthy fertile soils. Um, you're not stripping any vegetation off. You're leaving all that organic matter in place. You're not using a pesticide uh, like a chemical herbicide um, and your neighbors don't have to look at a, sh a sheet of plastic in your front yard for six weeks in the middle of summer. And then finally, the last and my probably preferred method for uh, ridding yourself of lawn is just benign neglect. Just stop mowing and see what happens. Uh, and this is largely experimental. Uh, every lawn is gonna be slightly different. You might find that you end up with some weeds you didn't really, uh, you didn't really want. Um, in my case, I sometimes get thistle that blows into the yard. Um, and that's a weed that I really wanna control because I don't want my kids to step on it with bare feet or I don't want myself to step on it with bare feet. Uh, and so you might find that you, you get some, uh, some problematic weeds that blow in. Uh, you've gotta manage those as they come in. Uh, but this is a great way to sort of just allow an instant meadow to happen in your, in your neck of the woods. Um, you, can, uh, you can seed with perennial wildflower mixes if you want um, directly into the lawn. Uh, you can plant perennials uh, into the lawn. Maybe um, uh, you can plant some warm season grasses like little blue stem or some of the other plants that I'll, I'll uh, suggest in uh, just a few minutes when we start talking about plants. Um, or you can just kind of let it go and let it do its thing. Uh, and one thing that I do recommend is if you're gonna allow your lawn to just slowly convert itself over to meadow is um, just to send a signal to your neighbors that you haven't just given up uh, or you haven't just uh, uh, foregone, foregone your responsibilities as a, as a homeowner uh, or a, a good citizen, um, mow, a, mow a strip, mow an edge around it uh, so it looks like it's, it's still maintained uh, and it looks intentional. 
uh, it's a it's a great way to signal to the neighbors that um, you haven't just stopped managing your your landscape, but you're doing it a little bit differently. Uh, again, maybe that's an entry point for a conversation with your with your with your neighbors. Um, so now we're going to transition into um, talking about uh, plant alternatives. So alternatives to lawn. And I have a background in native plants. Uh, I'm going to heavily emphasize native plants as we go through the rest of this conversation. I think there are a lot of native plants that work really well as lawn alternatives, um, but there are also uh, non-native species that work really well as lawn alternatives. Um, one of my favorites is uh, a weed that blew into my lawn uh, the first year I, I moved into my house, uh, and it's a juga, um, which is a very common um, ground cover, evergreen ground cover. I have a ton of the juga that invaded my lawn. I love it. It's perfect. It works really well. Gives me great flowers in the spring. Um, I let the flowers go to seed so it can spread itself around a little bit more, uh, and it's a fantastic lawn alternative. It doesn't happen to be native, so I won't talk about it much this evening because I'm really focused on natives tonight. Um, but the first thing in deciding what plants to use as suitable alternatives to, to a lawn is to really understand what your garden has to offer. You know, uh, what is your soil type? Do some soil tests, really understand what your soil type is. Um, how much moisture do you have on your property? Uh, is your, it, you know, is the area where your lawn is um, typically, does it typically puddle? Does it have standing water? Or is it on the top of a slope and sandy and really dry all the time? Uh, is this full sun? Is this part sun? Is this a shady site? Um, so really, you know, think about all those things so that you can make the best decisions about which plants will do best uh, in, your, in your new garden or as a lawn alternative. Uh, and then find plants that suit your site. So pretty simple process, but something that we almost always forget about. Um, match the cultural properties of your garden uh, to the cultural needs of the plants that you want to add. Whether you're using native species or non-native species, it's always important that you um, select plants that are going to be successful as opposed to trying to uh, use plants that uh, you have to prop up with uh, irrigation, fertilizer, pesticides. Um, so find plants that will thrive without inputs once established. Um, little talk about native plants for a minute. Uh, there's uh, many different ways to define what we mean by native. Um, typically, people think about two factors. Um, those two factors being time and method of introduction. Uh, in the US, we tend to look back and say that anything that was here at the time of European settlement is a native species. Um, I tend to think more about how a plant came to be here versus when a plant came to be here. Uh, we know that we were uh, that this area was under a sheet of ice, you know, 10, 12, 14,000 years ago. So everything that's here migrated from someplace else after, those, after the glacier receded. Um, so we have a relatively young uh, uh, flora. We have a relatively young, um, uh, um, you know, uh, ecosystem. And a lot of the plants that are here uh, are those that were quick to establish, you know, quick to move up the coastline once those uh, uh, glaciers receded. Um, but that doesn't mean that that migration stopped at the time that European settlers first arrived here. And that's sort of what you do when you say, well, something that was here at the time of European settlement is, is native, something that was here uh, afterwards is non-native. Um, so I, I usually like to try to tell people that um, native uh, plants are those that existed or, or those that uh, came to exist in an area without the benefit of human introduction. Um, so there are plants that are still migrating into our area today. Um, and uh, it's important that we think about uh, native species is those that migrated naturally as opposed to being introduced by people. Um, because oftentimes we bring plants across large geographic distances, across oceans, uh, across mountain ranges, uh, and uh, sometimes they cause problems uh, like uh, with invasive species. They don't always, and in fact, they, uh, they rarely do, um, but sometimes they do. Um, and so that's just a little bit about defining native. Uh, I have a whole lecture on that uh, we can talk about uh, uh, later on. Um, for my purposes, I usually like to try to look beyond political boundaries and choose plants that are native to particular ecoregions. These are large geographic areas, areas that share similar cultural um, uh, uh, sort of um, characteristics. Um, 
And so in New England, we have five different ecoregions. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about ecoregions, I suggest you uh, just Google ecoregions, uh, EPA, and you can find all sorts of information out about them. Um, in my neck of the woods in central Massachusetts, uh, we're in the northeastern coastal zone. So I try to choose plants that are native to the northeastern coastal zone, which extends down into uh, New Jersey, parts of New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, up into Maine, uh, and New Hampshire. So a pretty broad um, geographic area to select plants from. And why is it important to choose native species? Uh, well, a few different reasons here that I like to share. Uh, when properly sited, native plants don't need fertilizer and irrigation like we've been talking about. They provide critical habitat for native pollinators and wildlife. Uh, they help us to establish a unique sense of place. Using native plants uh, helps to sort of reinforce the cultural identity of whatever region it is that you're in. Um, there are a lot of native plants that are stunningly beautiful. And then finally, they're adapted to, to New England's climate, soil, uh, water, and ecology. All right, so without further ado, I'd like to roll into talking about um, some of my favorite lawn alternatives. Now, in some cases, these lawn alternatives will look like a traditional lawn. In other cases, they won't. Uh, what I'm really looking for out of a lawn alternative is, is something that is mat forming, something that's gonna colonize an area, um, something that once established will keep uh, other plants from uh, moving in, other des less desirable species, weedy species that I don't want, uh, and something that's going to be pretty self-sufficient with a whole lot of, without a whole lot of input from me. Um, in some cases, my lawn alternatives are really short, um, and uh, in other cases, my lawn alternatives might be taller than you'd expect. Some of my lawn alternatives are herbaceous, some of them are woody, um, some of them are evergreen, some of them are deciduous. Um, so just to give you a little bit of a perspective on what, what I really mean when I say lawn alternative. Um, so first and foremost is wild strawberry. This is Fregaria virginiana. It's a very common lawn weed actually. Uh, it's a species that is um, a pretty great colonizer. It's a mat forming perennial. Uh, it's semi evergreen, although I wouldn't really consider it an evergreen species. Has great uh, white flowers in the spring. Um, this is a fantastic native plant that gets, uh, gets uh, really tasty edible fruits um, in the middle of June. And it's a, a, a plant that really works well. It forms a very dense uh, mat of foliage that uh, is highly competitive, uh, really keeps a lot of other plant species at bay, um, and works incredibly well as a lawn alternative. A uh, garden I used to work at called Garden in the Woods, we had a fantastic lawn of uh, Fregaria virginiana. We mowed it once a year just to kind of keep it a little bit contained after the fruit was, uh, was finished, after we'd enjoyed it. Um, it's a great pollinator plant, supports a lot of different lepidopterans, uh, the moth and butterfly um, caterpillars, um, and it forms a really nice tasty fruit, as I mentioned before. Very small, packed with sugar, uh, just delicious. Um, it really works well in combination with another lawn alternative. This is a, a warm season grass called Aragrostis spectabilis or purple lovegrass. Uh, this is a plant that you've all seen if you've driven on the highways in uh, especially southeastern Massachusetts. Um, it forms this purple cast in about July and August. Uh, it looks like crabgrass most of the year. It's a fairly coarse um, uh, sort of clumping warm season grass. It's very active over the summer so it's, it's green uh, at a time when cool season turf grasses are, are really more brown. Doesn't require any irrigation, doesn't require fertilizer, and has this fantastic purple color uh, in the middle of summer. It's really attractive. Um, these two work very well in combination with each other, although I will say that oftentimes the strawberry sort of wins out, uh, as is the case of the, the uh, lawn that we planted at Garden in the Woods quite a few years back. Um, but, uh, but that's okay because the strawberry is edible, uh, gets this great fruit, um, and it's very, very tasty. Uh, another good mat forming perennial that looks a little bit like strawberry is the barren strawberry, GM frigarioides. Barren strawberry has a, a yellow flower as opposed to the white flower that you saw with wild strawberry. Um, this is more of a clumping species and it's one that um, requires just a little bit of shade. I'd rather be in some shade than in full, full sun. Uh, and it would rather have a little bit more moisture than the Frigaria virginiana does. Uh, although it's very tolerant of a pretty wide range of soil conditions. It is not evergreen, so it dies back to the ground in the, in the fall uh, and then comes up in the spring. It has beautiful 
glossy green foliage. Uh, it's not as vigorous a spreader as the uh, wild strawberry that we looked at before, um, but it can definitely form a pretty dense colony. Uh, and you can see it here at the base of, a, of an oak tree. Uh, it just forms that nice dense mat, beautiful yellow flowers in the spring. Uh, and it's just a fantastic ground cover. Definitely something that I would see as a great uh, lawn alternative. Um, uh, one that looks more like a grass is this uh, sedge. Now, sedges are not grasses, they're graminoids, um, so it's not a true grass, but it, but it is, uh, it sort of functions like a grass. This is Carex pennsylvanica. You can see it in the foreground here um, with some may apple in the background. Uh, this is uh, probably the best lawn alternative for shady dry sites. Um, Carex pennsylvanica gets about six or eight inches tall. It tends to flop over, as you can see in the, the image here. Uh, will tolerate really dry soils. Uh, it's native to the, you know, sort of oak forest understory. Um, so it does well with very little fertility, uh, very little moisture. Uh, it's a spreader, forms these dense uh, mats um, through the, uh, the, the stoloniferous growth habit that it has. Um, you can see it here flowering on the left. It's actually flowering right now. Um, if you left it, if you let it go and didn't mow it, uh, that's what it looks like. Uh, that's not what I really would call a good lawn alternative. It's it's uh, a little too rough for me, uh, not as attractive as I would hope for, um, but this is that same lawn um, just a few weeks after it was mowed. Um, it's the, the type of lawn that only needs to be mowed once a year, which is pretty great. Uh, the coarser foliage that you see coming up is a, a bulb called, called uh, Camasia, um, but the Carex is the really thin sort of strappy foliage that you can see in the, uh, the majority of that image. Uh, it's just, the, I don't think you get a better lawn alternative than Carex pennsylvanica, uh, especially in dry, um, uh, shady sites. Um, it's definitely not something you're going to be able to play soccer on, uh, but you could have the occasional cocktail party on it. Uh, mow it once a year if you want to, or just let it go floppy and let it do its thing. Actually, I take back what I said before. This picture was taken in spring um, after it had been mowed uh, the previous season. So one mowing a year, sometime around the middle of June. Uh, that's really all you need to do with Carex pennsylvanica, and it'll look a lot like a, a typical turf grass lawn. Um, another warm season grass that's native to New England is little blue stems, Gizicarium scoparium. But this is one that definitely gets uh, quite a bit taller than the traditional lawn alternative. Uh, has great color in the fall. Uh, little blue stem tends to turn sort of blue to purple to silver and then to a nice light uh, sort of tan color for the winter. Stays very upright. Um, is definitely an aggressive grass that will spread a lot. Um, and it's a clumper. So it, what's nice about a clumping warm season grass like this one is it allows you to grow a lot of uh, interesting perennials uh, and more colorful, uh, you know, earlier season um, uh, flowering plants around it during the, uh, during the early part of the season and then let the schizocarium sort of take over at the end of the season. Uh, this is what it looks like in the winter. Um, just a really beautiful grass, always stays very upright uh, and, you know, really works well as sort of a tall grass. Uh, lawn alternative and, and one that I really happen to like a lot. Uh, I don't like grasses that flop over. I really want my grasses to stay really upright uh, because little blue stem is fairly rigid and, and dense and upright. Uh, I, I like it as a, as a warm season, tall warm season grass that you can leave up for the winter. Um, one that looks a lot less like a grass is Chrysogonum virginianum. This is gold star or green and gold. Uh, this is a native um, uh, aster and this one actually has the interesting distinction of, of sometimes blooming year round. And when I say that, um, Chrysogonum starts blooming sometime in late spring. You get these great yellow uh, aster-like blossoms. Um, the plant itself doesn't get very tall, so six inches, uh, you know, maybe as high as 12 inches on occasion, but not very often. Uh, does well in a range of uh, cultural conditions. We'll take sun, we'll take shade, we'll take dry, we'll take moist. Um, it repeats blooming. So it blooms heaviest in late spring, but then it continues to bloom straight through the summer. Uh, it'll bloom a little bit in the fall. And every once in a while, you get a flower that will just kind of freeze in place and last all winter long and still be there in the spring uh, when the new foliage starts to come up that following season. 
Um, so it doesn't happen very often, but it, it can bloom year round almost. Uh, but it's just a great little ground cover, very dense, uh, you know, not quite as aggressive or uh, mat forming as something like the wild strawberry that we saw early on, or even the barren strawberry, um, but it's just a fantastic sort of rock solid, small, uh, uh, low ground cover. One of my favorite plants is this one. This is Sibaldiopsis tridentata, the three-toothed sinca foil. I like really functional plants. I like plants that uh, uh, really serve a great purpose. Um, and this uh, three-toothed sinca foil does just that. It's a, a very tough plant. It's actually a small shrub. Uh, you can't really tell from the picture, but it does have a woody stem. It's in the rose family, so it gets flowers that look uh, quite a bit like an apple blossom um, or a pear. Um, uh, what, what I love about Sibaldiopsis, it'll, it'll grow just about anywhere that nothing else will grow. So it likes very poor soils. It likes, uh, you know, hot, dry, um, sandy sites. It, I have it planted up at the top of my driveway where it gets pummeled with um, sand and salt all winter long, uh, gets buried in snow, has beautiful foliage in the wintertime. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't include a picture of it, but the, the, uh, the leaves turn a beautiful purplish uh, and it holds onto that foliage color straight through the winter. And then this time of the year, it starts to green up as it starts to actively grow again, right about the time that it starts to flower. Um, so just a really resilient plant, one that I, I happen to, uh, absolutely love great glossy green evergreen foliage that turns purple in the fall uh, holds that color straight through the winter and I say six to eight inches here mine has been planted for a long time it spreads uh, and gets about three to four inches tall so it's it's pretty short um, you'll oftentimes see this listed as um, potentilla tridentata that's the old name Sibaldiopsis is the newer name uh, another deciduous ground cover mat forming perennial is a serum canadense, the wild ginger or Canada wild ginger. Uh, this one's actually blooming right now. This is the only time you can really catch the flowers uh, right as the foliage is emerging, emerging is when it, when it flowers. Um, so if you have this planted in your garden, go look for it. You'll see the flower. Um, it's uh, it's a, a great ground cover, holds the soil really well, uh, forms this nice dense mat. There are European species that uh, remain evergreen, but a serum candidense uh, is, is deciduous. So it'll die back to the ground in the fall and the new foliage comes up pretty early in the spring. Um, has kind of a nice blue-green cast to it, almost a hazy cast to it uh, for, uh, for the majority of the growing season. And then there on the left-hand side, you can see what the flower looks like. Certainly not very attractive or ornamental, but definitely very interesting. Uh, just a beautiful, or not even beautiful, but just an interesting little flower that, uh, that blooms this time of the year. Um, another great mat forming perennial is Pacara abovada, the running groundsel. There's two species of Pacara in our area, Pacara abovada and Pacara aurea. Um, you'll sometimes see these listed as Senecio, that's the old name. Um, Pacara is a great dense uh, mat forming perennial. Works very well in combination with little blue stem. Uh, so I mentioned that there are mat forming perennials or, or uh, uh, you know, uh, spring flowering, summer flowering species that you can plant in combination with little blue stem because it's a clumper. Uh, and this would, this would definitely fall into that category. The foliage doesn't get much taller than say two or three inches. Uh, and then it sends up a flower spike that looks like this uh, in the spring. Uh, I noticed Pacara Tower Hill today uh, that has a flower spike that's maybe uh, five to six inches tall. Uh, looks like what you see there on the right hand side. It's very interesting. The early season foliage is purple. The buds are purple and then they, uh, they pop open and then there's really bright yellow uh, sort of fooling you into thinking that it's going to be a purple flower until right about the time that it opens. Um, it's a great ground cover, um, definitely pretty versatile. We'll take dry, we'll take a little bit of shade in the summertime, uh, goes sort of dormant in the summer, but stays nice and green. Um, another grass uh, lawn alternative is Sparabolus heterolepis, the prairie drop seed. This is my favorite lawn alternative for a steep slope um, or an area where you really want a monoculture. This plant definitely works very well as a monoculture. It's rare in the wild in New England, um, but it's very commonly found in cultivation. Uh, it's, uh, this is a, a lawn that 
they have at Chanticleer, which is one of my favorite gardens in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, they actually burn this every single year. So every spring about this time of the year, uh, they go through and burn this, uh, this Spirobolus lawn um, just to rejuvenate it. And then it comes back uh, every single season and looks fantastic. Uh, it's got great color. It's got great form. It sends up a flower spike uh, in the middle of the summer uh, that's really delicate and fine. And uh, just overall, just a fantastic alternative to a traditional lawn. Uh, another sort of non-traditional um, uh, lawn alternative is, is Christmas fern. Um, this is an evergreen fern, sends up a fiddlehead like you can see in the image here, um, but it stays glossy green straight through the winter. Um, this is a plant that does best in sort of part sun to full shade, likes moist, well-drained soils, um, but it is pretty drought tolerant. I have it in a few spots in my garden where it does well uh, without any care or attention at all. Um, this is one where if you'd like to, you can cut off the old fronds in the spring um, before the new fronds emerge uh, to try to neaten it up a little bit. But I don't do that in my garden. I like to just leave the old fronds. I think the old foliage is beautiful. It'll hang around for years and years. Uh, and it just forms this nice, dense, uh, green, evergreen mat. Another shrub uh, is Arctostaphylos uva ursi. This is bearberry. And we only, this might be, we might have one other plant after this one. So we're, we're, we'll be wrapping up here in just a second. I know we're just past time. Um, this uh, bearberry gets about three to eight inches tall, uh, uh, forms these nice bright red berries. Um, it's uh, an, an evergreen, uh, really needs well-drained soil, wants to be planted almost in sand, wants to be in full sun. In fact, we lost a lot of bearberry in the garden last year because we had 11 inches of rain in November and it sat there and just kind of rotted through the winter. This is a plant that really does not like moisture. It wants to be sandy, it wants to be dry. Uh, it'd be quite happy if it's sandy and dry, but it's not one that's gonna do, uh, do well with any kind of standing water at all. Uh, but once it's established, it forms a very, very dense mat. Does the same thing as the Sabaldiopsis triventata that I mentioned, where it turns kind of purplish for the winter, um, but it's a fantastic evergreen species. I think more people should use that, especially on banks, um, as, a, as a great lawn alternative. And then the final, um, uh, final lawn alternative that I have uh, is this great combination. This is Phlox de Vericata, the wild blue phlox. It's getting ready to bloom relatively soon. And uh, Tiarella cordifolia, the white flower that you see. Um, both of these work great in combination. Uh, definitely work better in a shady environment uh, and want a little bit of fertility, some moisture in the soil. Um, Tiarella cordifolia is a dense mat forming perennial that has this beautiful white flower uh, in early to mid-May. Um, Phlox stevericata has uh, anywhere from uh, uh, pink to purple to white flower, um, very fragrant. They work great in combination. They just, uh, they, they, they behave very well together. They uh, always bloom at the same time. It's just a fantastic and thrilling combination. Uh, Tiarella has a lot of uh, different characters characteristics in the foliage, a lot of diversity in the foliage, as you can see in this image here, uh, and just a fantastic alternative. This is a much more attractive um, lawn, I think, uh, than the first couple of images that we saw. And I wish more people would aspire to this kind of uh, setting uh, and this kind of uh, garden um, than the one that you see in the image here. So just to wrap up, American lawns are wasteful, environmentally damaging, pretty boring and sterile. They require excessive inputs of water, fertilizer, pesticides. Uh, I hope I've convinced you that there are myriad ways we can replace lawns in our landscapes. Uh, and then finally, just to leave you with these parting words, our garden should contribute positively to environmental quality. And one easy way to do that is to kill your lawn. Um, and with that, I'm going to unmute you guys and open it up to any questions that you might have. So bear with me for a second while I do that. I'm also gonna go through all the chat. I saw a number of questions come through. Um, and so I'm gonna go through uh, those questions as well. Um, so let's start there and then I'll, I'll unmute everybody. And if you wanna ask any questions that way, you're welcome to. Um, so first question I see is that one about the iconic lawn garden at Tower Hill. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it's, you know, that's a, that's a lawn that we try to manage uh, as best we can to be environmental stewards. Uh, one thing that we're doing this year with our, uh, with our lawn care equipment is we've actually bought a commercial grade electric mower. Uh, it's a 48 inch uh, uh, riding or stand on mower and we'll be converting all of our um, 
uh, all of our lawn care equipment over to electric as uh, as we as we can um, to really try to limit our use of fossil fuels. Um, and uh, and so that's one one step that you can take. the The technology for electric mowers has really come a long way, uh, and we're definitely at a point where um, you can find uh, electric mowers that are uh, are you know long lasting, commercial grade, uh, and will do all that you want them to, uh, and uh, not require the use of fossil fuels. Ours is a, a plug-in um, uh, lithium-ion batteries. Uh, it'll run for about six hours a day uh, and definitely uh, uh, we'll be really happy to use that as opposed to the fossil fuel burning mower that we've been using for, uh, for a long time. Um, someone mentions that the problem with solarization is using plastic um, and plastics are definitely an issue. Uh, I highly recommend that everybody watch the um, uh, PBS documentary that came out recently called um, Plastic Wars. Uh, it's really kind of frightening uh, what plastics do in our environment and also just the proliferation of plastics worldwide. Um, talks a lot about how recycling is really a sham that was perpetrated by the petroleum industry. Uh, and unfortunately, it's true. We were all sort of duped. Um, and so we ought to be doing as much as we can to limit our use of plastics. Uh, and so, yeah, that, that, and that, that's certainly a consideration with solarization is we should be uh, looking to try to limit the use of plastics, not using plastics if we can help it. Uh, one thing I will say about it is if you know of a greenhouse uh, operation in your area, um, they reskin their greenhouses every few years. Um, and that's a great way to get a piece of recycled uh, clear plastic, use that as opposed to uh, using a virgin piece of plastic. Uh, and that's uh, not as bad as using a virgin piece of plastic. It uh, looks like somebody took care of spelling a juga for me. So thank you very much. Um, uh, please suggest where to find these, these alternatives. Uh, all the plants that I talked about this evening are, are for the most part pretty commonly available. Uh, there might be a couple that you'd have uh, some trouble in finding. Um, a couple places I'll recommend. There's a mail order um, a seed nursery called Prairie Moon that sells a lot of native species from seed. Uh, you can definitely buy a lot of these plants uh, through Prairie Moon, pretty cost effective doing it with seed. Um, any native plant nursery, there's a number of native plant nurseries in our area and frankly any nursery that sells um, perennials will have most of the plants that I talked about this evening. Um, bearberry is a very common shrub. That uh, three-toothed cinquefoil, Sibaldiopsis is a very common shrub. Uh, these are not hard plants to find. Um, so the, these should definitely be plants that you could easily find at most garden centers and nurseries. Um, any planning websites or resources for redoing a yard? Uh, that's tough. I would say that your best bet is to visit botanic gardens, um, gain inspiration from visiting botanic gardens, find out what you like, what you don't like. Um, and then, you know, it might be helpful to, uh, if, you're, if you're tepid or nervous about uh, redoing your landscape or, re or, or designing, uh, you know, designing your landscape. Uh, and, and if you have some means, uh, you know, maybe hire a professional, hire a landscape designer, um, uh, or at least reach out to someone uh, to, uh, to gain some advice. I'm sure you have gardening friends who would be more than happy to offer some advice about, uh, about your garden and what you might be able to do. Um, Someone said Polysticum and Asarum would be a nice combination for shadier areas. Absolutely, I think that's a great idea. So the Polysticum is the Christmas fern, Asarum is the, uh, the wild ginger that we both saw. Um, what were the last two combination plants you recommended again? Uh, so those were Phlox divericata, which is the wild blue uh, phlox or woodland, not, not woodland phlox, wild blue phlox uh, and foam flower, uh, Tiarella cordifolia. So foam, F-O-A-M, foam flower. Um, and I see a question about meant mostly for the backyard versus front yard. I think that's up to you. Uh, I definitely would include any of these plants in my front yard, um, but I think that's personal preference uh, and a lot of that's peer pressure. Um, and then finally, someone says, I have grubs, what do you recommend? Um, so the best, uh, best treatment that I know of for grubs is milky spore. Uh, it's a biological control um, that you can apply. Um, uh, it builds up in the soil over time, so you apply it for a few years and then you don't ever have to apply it again. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, probably the most sustainable way that you can uh, rid yourself of, of grubs in your lawn. Um, I am going to unmute you when I can figure out how to do that. And then uh, if, if anybody wants to ask any questions um, uh, that way, I'd be happy to stick around. 
uh, and answer a few more questions. Hold on a second. All right. Looks like I have a couple more chats. Uh, is there a minimum size area we should start with if we didn't want to do the entire lawn at once? I would say no. It's going to really depend on your personal um, situation, um, you know, how much lawn you have. Uh, but I think it makes sense to chip away at it, um, to do it slowly, um, not to bite off more than you can chew. Um, so, you know, start someplace small, start with maybe a 10 by 10 square foot area, 100 or oh, 10 by 10 area, you know, maybe 100 square feet, something like that. Um, someone asks if Pachysandra is native. Uh, we do have a, a nearly native Pachysandra. Uh, it's called uh, Allegheny Spurge Pachysandra uh, Procumbens. Um, I think it's Procumbens. Uh, the the Pachysandra that we typically find, the Japanese Pachysandra is not native. That's Pachysandra Procumbens. Uh, the Pachysandra that I'm uh, recommending that's a nearly native one that's more of a southeastern species. I'm drawing a blank on the name uh, for some reason. I, I just can't think of it, but it's a, it's a native Pachysandra. It looks somewhat different, not as glossy. Uh, the foliage uh, is more mottled. I find it more interesting. Uh, it's flowering right now, sends up a really beautiful flower spike in the spring. Uh, and for the life of me, I'm just having a, 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 a hard time remembering what the specific epithet for that native Pachysandra is. I apologize for that, but there is a nearly native Pachysandra. Um, so few of you have stuck around. Anybody have any questions that you want to ask verbally as opposed to the chat? And you're all unmuted by me. So if you want to ask a question, you have to unmute yourself. I do have a question. All right. um, what do you think about clover as a lawn alternative? Mm. I love clover. Um, so there's um, uh, white clover, red clover. Um, you know, I think, I think in, uh, uh, they work really well as, um, as a companion to lawns. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so clover is uh, nitrogen fixing. So what that means is um, it has a symbiotic relationship with nitrogen fix fixing bacteria that are in the soil um, that um, uh, it can actually fix atmospheric nitrogen. So it produces its own fertilizer, essentially. Uh, and so the nice thing about using clover in combination with, uh, with other um, species is that they sort of, you know, as clover expands and contracts, uh, it actually adds more nitrogen to the soil. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a great way to feed your lawn. In fact, uh, up until the, um, uh, up until World War II, uh, one of the best recommendations that most people had for lawns was to incorporate clover into it uh, because it was a free source of nitrogen. Um, I think clover is great intermixed in a lawn. I think every lawn should have some clover in it um, for various reasons. One, it's a great pollinator plant. Uh, bees certainly love it when it's in flower. Uh, and, and also because of that, uh, because of that great, um, uh, because of that great tech or that that great ecological uh, sort of purpose that it has in fixing nitrogen and providing fertilizer for the plants that are growing around it uh, and that's any clover so red white clover either either red or white clover would would do that um, there's actually a, um, a proprietary lawn mix called I think it's called earth turf um, the developers of earth turf um, bred something called micro clover it has very small foliage. Um, and so for those of us, for those, of, for those folks that don't really like the look of a broadleafed uh, plant like clover um, in their lawn, uh, they develop something called micro clover that's really tiny foliage, um, doesn't show up as much as, uh, as the, you know, the big like red clover uh, foliage does. Um, so if you're interested, you can look for that. It's, it's called earth turf. It's fairly expensive, uh, but it's a, a really great mix of uh, lawn grasses that also includes some clover. So does that answer your question, Beth? It does, thank you. Okay, sure. All right, any other questions? Okay, I have another one. Yeah, sure. Um, it's not so much, like, what do you recommend for dealing with uh, voles? With vol oh, voles? Oh, voles? Oh, voles are hard. I have voles in my garden at home. Um, so, you know, a couple things. Um, foxes are the best defense against voles. 
Uh, and I know that, you know, we don't, we don't breed foxes. Um, what's great about foxes is that uh, foxes cache their prey. Um, so, you know, like a, uh, a lot of predators will, will catch um, something, then they'll stop, they'll eat it, uh, and then they'll go and catch something else. Uh, what foxes do is they, uh, they go and hunt, and they hunt and hunt and hunt and hunt and hunt. Uh, they bring all that prey back to their den. Um, and then they and then they eat it, and so they're really effective at killing things like white-footed mouse um, or um, the uh, or or voles. Um, so anything you can do to um, uh, anything you can do to encourage foxes in your uh, in your uh, garden is really really helpful. Um, but also a good alternative to foxes are garden cats, uh, and I know a lot of times people get hung up on. Uh, the notion that cats, uh, uh, you know, are, are harmful to uh, song nest or songbirds, uh, and that's certainly a consideration. Like with anything, there are always trade-offs. Um, but uh, but I think cats are pretty effective at, at taking care of voles. We have garden cats uh, at Tower Hill. We got a couple of cats from an organization locally called Car. I think it's called Karma, C-A-R-M-A-H, uh, that tries to pair. Um, barn cats, so feral cats that are uh, found by people uh, with people who are looking for a barn cat. Uh, and it's a, a great way to give a, a shelter animal a home. Uh, we got a couple last year from that organization. Uh, so to, a pair of brothers, uh, and they're really effective mousers. They're very effective at killing voles. Um, and there's, there's sort of no, uh, no better alternative if you don't have a lot of foxes um, for killing voles or, or, uh, or at least um, trying to prevent voles in your garden than, than something like a predator, like a garden cat. Um, let me see. Any other, any other questions? Uh, Emma, I see your comment. I've tried to unmute you a couple of times, yeah, so I'm not sure. It, oh, there you go. I got it now. I don't right. think I was having a technical problem. Okay. Um, I don't have a question. I just wanted to make a just a quick announcement to the group. Uh, my name's Emma, guys. I'm the adult education manager at Tower Hill, so I've met some folks, and I just wanted to let everybody know that um, we're going to try to keep doing a webinar on Wednesday evenings. It might not be um, Mark leading us each week, but um, check back in the next couple of days to see what we have on offer because we're going to try to have something up for you uh, next week as well. Great. Thanks, Emma. All right. Well, thank if you. there aren't any other questions, I think, I think that about does it. So thank you all for sticking in. I know it's getting late, but I uh, really appreciate you joining us this evening uh, and look forward to more webinars in the future. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you.